people to uh, first of all welcome here um, our long-serving economics professor uh, Philip Robbins uh, and uh, his wife Susie at the front here. Uh, Phil, can you stand and take a bow for a moment? So, um, Phil is uh, the very uh, Phil and Susie are the very proud father and mother of Jason Robbins, our next guest. So. Um, I want to reassure all of the alumni here that we don't just leverage the alumni, we also leverage our faculty. Uh, so um, just very briefly, uh, Jason is the uh, chief executive officer and co-founder of DraftKings, which was founded in uh, 2012 and is the leading uh, fantasy sports uh, provider in the United States. And um, he uh, graduated from uh, Duke University, but of course uh, grew up in, uh, in this area. He has a number of major accolades uh, in the 40 under 40 list uh, from Fortune Magazine, the Sports Business Journal, and uh, the Boston Business Journal, among others. Um, what we're going to do is a slightly different format for uh, Jason. We're going to have a face-to-face uh, -face, uh, fireside chat interview and uh, interviewing Jason is going to be Rolando Aedo, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. And I'm proud to say that uh, uh, Rolando is a uh, MBA in International Business from uh, the University of Miami. And uh, he was born in Norfolk, uh, Virginia, but came very early uh, to Miami and uh, has uh, had a tremendous uh, career in many public service roles in the Miami area. So we're very appreciative, uh, Rolando, of you sparing time today as well. Uh, let me invite both you and Jason to the stage. So I have the, uh, the privilege, actually, of not only addressing all of you, and thank you, Dean Welsh and, and Roni from development, and Enrique. Uh, I've had an opportunity to kind of re-engage with my alma mater. Hopefully you guys uh, do it uh, every day because it's been a, a true privilege and pleasure to not only live in this community most of my life but be associated with this institution. Uh, it's, meant, it's meant a lot to me personally and of course professionally. I can uh, honestly say it's been one of the reasons that I do what I do at, the, at a high level. I don't know if uh, you know too much about our organization and I won't spend too much time but the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau is the organization that brings meetings, conventions, major events to our community. In fact, uh, next week we'll be with NFL. They're in town. They have a, it's supposed to be under the radar screen, but I just spilled <laughs> the beans. So the whole NFL crew is in town as we're planning for the 2020 Super Bowl. Uh, we, we set it up that way for this, for this day, of course. But, uh, so they're in town. We, we are the ones that put together those bids for major events. Uh, we're working on everything from World Cup soccer in 2026 to NFL to the Democratic National Convention. Uh, so those are the things that we do kind of behind the scenes. Um, as, the, as the dean said, I've, uh, I've been here most of my life. I, I don't li live too far from here. I've got two kids, a little bit older than uh, I think Jason's kids, and it's amazing how well rested he looks. He's got a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and an infant. But I think that's because grand the grandparents are helping out a lot. So <laughs> I know I couldn't have done it without my, uh, my grandparents. So, so yeah, it's it's... You know, one of the things that we'll talk about, and, and, and this is a fireside chat. Does anybody, does anybody know, does everybody know where fireside chat, uh, fireside chat comes from? We well, don't count. <laughs> <laughs> yes, FDR, the infamous fireside chats back in the 40s when he would address everyone on radio, no less. So uh, this will be a, a more progressive version of that. But, um, you know, one of the things that I know was covered in his bio and uh, some things that weren't covered as bio are, are how did Jason get started in this amazing, uh, not only company, but industry that, that is as big as it is because of him. And one of the little anecdotes that was shared with, with me was when he would spend a lot of time with his parents reviewing all statistics of sporting events. And I believe you guys would then quiz him. And, if he, and I guess if he didn't answer correctly, he didn't get breakfast. Is that how it worked <laughs> out? But. Uh, but I think it's all those moments in your life with loved ones that really inspire you to do the things you do. So um, I want to turn it over to Jason and kind of give his perspective, not just on, on his family, but obviously this amazing uh, baby that he's uh, uh, cultivating called uh, FanDuel. So with it, Fanduel. I'm sorry, DraftKings. <laughs> yeah. I wanted, wanted to make sure he was paying attention. So Jason. Uh, well, I guess 
good starting point is just I grew up here, and um, you know I was a huge sports fan as a child. In particular, I was a huge University of Miami fan. I think I missed maybe two or three games between the ages of four, which is the first one I ever went to. When I graduated from high school, uh, I used to go to a ton of basketball and baseball games. I played at Ron Fraser's baseball camp. And the highlight of my athletic career was I, I made a double play at Ron Frazier's baseball camp. I caught a ball, and then the person who was on second wasn't paying attention to run. I ran in and tagged the base myself. And Ron Frazier actually gave me an award and said that was a heady play. Um, and I think what he was really trying to say is for somebody with no athletic skill, wow, you really <laughs> used your head on that one. Um, but that was the peak of my, my athletic career. I quickly learned I was a little bit better at the stats and business side, and as you mentioned, I used to love this back in the days of newspapers, um, all, reading all the box scores in newspapers, and when I could you know, get them to, I'd ask my parents to quiz me on those and uh, try to memorize the stats. So I, I always loved sports, and my entire childhood here, um, those memories were really built around the University of Miami more than anything else. And uh, you know, Several years later, after I finished up college, I went and worked in, uh, at, a, at Capital One at an office in Boston. And, um, after that, I worked at Vistaprint, and uh, through those two experiences, I met both of my co-founders. And uh, I was still a huge sports fan, and I started really, um, you know, everywhere I went, I would start the Office Fantasy League. So they knew I was into it because they were in the Fantasy League with me. And one day, one of my co-founders, Matt, brought to me this idea, and he said, "Hey, uh, I think this. We've been tossing around Matt and I and Paul as my other co-founder." ideas or probably you know 50 plus ideas we'd thrown around because I had the itch I really wanted to be an entrepreneur um, and none of them really seemed right and then when I heard this one it was like instantly it clicked I said I think this is it um, so I went and I got Paul involved and we started doing a little research and I looked online and sure enough there this wasn't a new idea <laughs> FanDuel and about two dozen others were already doing this so First, it was a little bit disconcerting. I thought, oh no, we're, we're too late. But then I, I realized I'm about as big a fan of fantasy as, he, as, as there gets. And if I hadn't heard of any of these things, maybe it's still early enough. And if we do things a little differently, maybe we can still be a major player in this market. So we started working nights and weekends for months and months. We would almost every night after our day jobs go over to Paul's house. He lived in Watertown, Massachusetts. And we would take over his spare bedroom and work till many hours of the evening. And then same thing on the mornings of Saturday and Sunday, we wake up around like six or seven, uh, sometimes eight, if we need a little extra rest. And we'd go and work the whole day there. And um, you know, basically between that and our day jobs, working over 100 hours a week. So it was, it was pretty brutal. But eventually, we got to a point where we had enough to go raise some money. We went out and raised uh, a little bit of money from VCs, quit our jobs. And the ride kind of started from there. You know, you're, you're renowned for your ability to raise money, and uh, I think a lot of the folks in the audience perhaps might be in similar <coughs> situations, trying to build up their organizations and uh, identifying whether it's VC firms or angel investors. Uh, tell us about some of that, because I'm sure a lot of the folks would like to know what, what makes you so good at raising money, spending other people's money. <laughs> Maybe I'm better at spending it, I don't know. But, uh, perhaps. I, you know, I, I think it's really its core is sales pitch. And just like anything you'd sell, you have to figure out who your audience is. You have to figure out what's going to resonate with them. Um, you know, and you have to make those points. And I think there's much judging you at the first stage. Obviously, as you get farther and you have a real business, they look at the business and they look at the metrics of the business. But when you're doing seed stage fundraising, I mean, we had nothing. We didn't have a live product. We had PowerPoint deck. and an Excel file and you know, three, three guys at our day jobs. And um, I think, by the way, we probably broke every cardinal rule. Like, you're not supposed to be at your day job. You're supposed to actually have a product. I think if we were trying to do that now, the environment's changed a little bit. It would be impossible. They want you to have a little more traction now. So a little bit was luck. Um, but you know what, what happened was, and I, I learned all this along the way, because I just at first would talk to anybody. I didn't have any preference on angel investor, VC, whoever I would talk to. And I wasted a lot of time on people, because everybody will take a meeting. Nobody doesn't take meetings. Some don't, but most do. Um, you know, I was pitching people who were like investing in solar energy projects and stuff. And one day I went back to this VC who had said no to me, and I asked him, what am I doing wrong? I think always asking for advice is good, and um, especially if somebody's already turned you down. Really got nothing to lose going back and asking for advice. 
So I went back and he's like, well, who are you talking to? And I told him a bunch of people and he's like, wrong person, wrong person, wrong person. I said, what do you mean? They're the investors, they invest in startups, don't they? He's like, look at what this person has invested in, it's solar energy, it's like solar projects, you know, sustainable energy. Is there anything that looks even remotely like what you're doing? And I said, no. Um, he's like, well, okay, like, why don't you talk to people who are into what you're doing? So the person who eventually he, he uh, referred me to uh, happened to be a big sports fan, big fantasy sports fan. His name is Ryan Moore. He was at Atlas Ventures, now called Accomplice Ventures in Boston. He was a college football player. So, I mean, he had a passion for the subject matter and for the space. And uh, I think getting to the right investor who's going to be into what you're doing is absolutely critical. And then the rest is just, you know, any sales, you know, sales pitch uh, it would tell you, you know, understand you know, what your key points are. Don't talk past them. Like, you don't have to answer questions that they're not asking because sometimes you're going to throw something out there that will spook them that really didn't even need to say. Um, and, you know, I also think there's an element of just persistence and not, not being discouraged when you hear no. We were said no to by 50-plus, uh, uh, and that was just that fundraising round. I mean, if you total them all up, I've been said no to by hundreds of people. And you just kind of kind of keep rolling. And some of them were tough. I mean, there were ones that brought us back in for like three, four visits, and we really thought we were going to get them there. And then they said no, and it can be crushing. But you just got to move on. You can't think too much about it. And I'd say that's a general rule for startups and business in general, but especially startups. If you get too caught up in the ups or downs, you're not going to make uh, create a successful business. You just have to stay steady. And um, I think that's been particularly true of us, but really at any startup, there's big, big highs. The highs are really high and the lows are really low. And you just got to kind of stay with your vision, stay consistent, obviously react to what you're seeing, but don't let the emotions ever get too, uh, play too much of a role in how you're thinking about things and don't get caught up in good and bad things that happen. You know, a lot of the folks in the room I, I either are sitting in C-suites or are aspiring to sit in C-suites and, and you've built this. So I, I guess by default, you've always been in that C-suite along with your co-founders. but. Share with some of the, uh, the, the students and the prospective uh, CEOs of tomorrow some of your insight as, as you go through this process, not only running a company, but starting and forming it as well. I was fortunate in that, because um, I probably would have tried to start a company out of college, but I say I was fortunate that I graduated right after the bubble burst, and that really wasn't an option. Um, so I actually went and worked at two companies, uh, Capital One and Vistaprint, before I started DraftKings. And not only did I learn a ton, I also met my two co-founders and a number of the original people that we hired. So that ended up being a really, really good thing. And I think I would have failed if I had tried to start out of school. Now, I never had a C-suite or even close job at any of those. I mean, these were my first two jobs out of college. I was originally an entry-level analyst and then you know, middle manager by the time uh, I started DraftKings, but never got to any incredibly senior level. But I did get some experience. I knew how to manage people. I knew how businesses operate. I understood how to use data and analytics and how to set up systems that you could rapidly test and iterate. Um, my co-founders as well, I met people who rounded out my skill set. So I knew how important it was to have a technology uh, or uh, a, a technologist as a co-founder. Um, that's something I think if you're in, I mean, it seems obvious, but I can't tell you how many people ask me, oh, do I need a technical co-founder? If, if you're in the tech industry, yes, you do. Unless that's you, you need a technical co-founder. Um, a lot of people don't think so, though. They think they can just hire into it. I believe that's absolutely critical. Um, and these are all things I learned by having some experience in, in business and, and at good companies, too. The companies I was at, Capital One and Vistaprint, well run, really smart people. They're also really, really, both of them were more than most this way really uh, into using data and analytics to make decisions, which is core to how DraftKings operates as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, Vistaprint really kind of disrupted that, that printing business yeah. using technology, digital, uh, and I think obviously uh, so did your, you know, your organization as well, and that's been one of the differentiators. That's what allowed you to accelerate that. You know, the digital space that we're all operating in, even in tourism, um, you know, some of the uh, biggest brands in travel are truly technology companies that happen to be selling travel. Um, tell us a little more about how digital, even through your uh, lifespan uh, and the company has evolved and how you're further leveraging it. So probably the biggest thing um, that's changed is mobile. 
when I was at Vistaprint, which was very strong on the digital side, not only did they have amazing technology, they layered this incredible direct marketing engine that was all an analytically driven on top of it. When I arrived there, they were spending over $100 million a year on all digital. Most of it was at a first order or, or shortly thereafter payback, and it was all rapidly optimized using the systems they built. So I had a really good understanding of how to set those types of things up, um, how to architect our initial database and structure it in a way that would both allow us to get the data we wanted now, but also be flexible as we added more complexity to the product. All of that and getting that right early on is incredibly important. Um, but when I was at Vistaprint, almost no one had a smartphone. I mean, this was like not that long ago, but uh, you know, people don't realize that 15 years ago, no one really had a smartphone. It's, it's uh, so big a part of our lives now, it's hard to imagine it was that recent 10, 15 years ago, but nobody did. And so Vistaprint really wasn't a mobile company. A lot of the same concepts apply, and similar to Capital One. Capital One, when I was there, was not a digital company, but how you do analytics, how you set up tests, all those things are the same at the highest level. Um, but there is a lot of specific subject matter around what types of channels you use to acquire customers in mobile, and um, the technology side is quite different in how it works from, from digital. Um, and that was something we really had to learn because now about 90% of our customers uh, use our mobile app, not our website. Yeah, and, and that's, uh, and even in our industry, 60%, it's not 90, but 60% of the folks that are engaging uh, in our business, travel, tourism, convention, are doing it on our mobile platform. And, and I bet five years ago it was like half it, of that, right? It, it was, it was. It was literally about 30%. So yeah. it's, it's increasing exponentially. We'll be at 90% soon. <laughs> um, so, so thanks. You know, again, bringing it back to, to, to this campus, and I know you're not a cane by, by credential, but you obviously have a strong connection with your parents. Um, tell us more about that. You know, growing up, your affinity for the school, what it meant to you directly, indirectly. Uh, I mean, I know it's special to me. I was here, I was here in the 80s, and if you can imagine, for those of you that remember, that's when UM football went through this roof. Uh, my classmates were Michael Irvin, Alonzo Highsmith. Uh -huh. uh, I wasn't a very well-disciplined undergrad, um, but thankfully I came, up, came back as a grad student. So kind of relive some of that and your connection to this, uh, to this school. Uh, I'm still a huge Canes fan. I mean, that, that's just never going to change. I love, I love the Canes. Um, and, you know, I grew up in the 80s, so very similar experience to the, uh, you, probably, uh, you know, from a different lens because I wasn't in school with those people, but I was watching them on the field, and how could you not get into it? I mean, it was just such an amazing thing. This team was unbelievably good. They just always, uh, Florida State, you know, or Notre Dame, just seemed to have all of those, the big teams' numbers. and. Um, had so many amazing rivalries to watch, and they had this swagger about them, which you know I know had some good and bad. But everybody, the the whole U episode on ESPN, like I mean that I remember when I was watching that, it just brought back so many memories, and um, I just fell in love with the the whole University of Miami uh, swag, the U, and everything about it then, and uh, it's kept up. I mean even now the turnover chain, everything, it just sort of all fits together with that same culture that I remember from the 80s when uh, I guess it started with Howard Schnellenberger, but my first memories were really of the Jimmy Johnson years. and um, That was my first really love uh, experience with sports and I, you know, my father uh, is a college professor here, my mother and father and I used to go to the games together. And, there's just so many memories of, of childhood, of playing baseball with my family at Mark Light Stadium when you know, we'd get a, a couple extra hours after the camp ended and my dad could throw the ball around and play catch with me. And I just have so many great memories. And sports is, uh, I think, something that for me has always been uh, a huge hobby, but also something that with all my loved ones I've really shared and it's meant a lot to me from that perspective as well. So growing up in the southern part of Miami, went to Miami Killian for high school. Yeah. I believe you went off to uh, Duke uh, for, uh, for college. And you know, I know one of the things that uh, I had the pleasure of meeting one of your colleagues, Aliza, that works in your PR. She went to Michigan. And what are you looking for when you're trying to select team, um, team members? I'm sure that you want folks that are going to further support the, the success that you've seen. But what are some of the attributes that you're specifically looking for? We just need more Alizas. Where's Aliza? Where's Aliza? Uh, there she is, uh, right up front. Yeah, there she is. So, um, 
No, she's great, and I think very uh, representative of, of what we are looking for. Uh, you know, first and foremost, um, we want people who are really smart and really, you know, dedicated to what they're doing. You have to have a high level of commitment to be at a startup. We're not early startup, but we're still very much a startup in our culture and mentality. So. Um, you have to have that attitude of it's not a nine to five job. It's something that really, you know, you're going to pour a lot more than that into. And um, you're probably going to be doing something that you're the only person in the company that can be relied on to do it. So, um, you know, that's big responsibility, which I think is different than working at a large company, but also something that requires a pretty heavy level of commitment. Um, we also want people that are collaborative, that are nice people. Um, we have a, a, a no a-hole policy. Um, and, you know, it's one thing, I think, to be driven and passionate and to push to get things done. Um, also to be candid, not to hold back on feedback. All of those things we, we not only um, allow, we, we encourage, we want that. We want what we call radical candor. Uh, in, free, in giving feedback and, and expressing opinions, but it has to be done in a collaborative way. It has to be done in a respectful way. Um, and people have to work together and they have to value that it's important to work together. And that's something we really look for and test as well. Um, interestingly, everybody asks me this, but being a sports fan is not a critical thing to, to working at DraftKings. In fact, we want a mix of different types of people. Um, you know, diversity comes both in uh, things like race and gender, but also for us, you know, background and interest. How many people came to DraftKings because they're really into sports versus they're really into technology versus they just want to be part of a disruptive startup. And having people who are there for different reasons and bring different perspectives and don't necessarily look at it through the lens of somebody who would be a customer is very helpful. Uh, and then the last thing that, that I would say is that um, we are a very analytical company, um, very data-driven company. So. Um, we, we look for people who are comfortable using data to make decisions and who embrace a culture and, and a, a model where data really drives the decisions. And, um, you know, it's nice because the data is the ultimate dispute settler. It's not who has the loudest voice. It's not who can make the best arguments. It's what the facts say. Uh, and that's how we make decisions. So what's the future of DraftKings? You have how many employees uh, globally? About 650 right now. And, and what, what does the future hold? What would you like it to hold, I guess, better? <laughs> well, I think for us, it's a very exciting time because about four and a half, actually, no, at this point, five and a half months ago, uh, there was a really big Supreme Court ruling, which, um, in effect, what was happening before was outside of Nevada, states were basically banned from legalizing sports betting. So the law never said it's illegal, never made sports betting federally illegal, um, kind of an odd one. They could have done that, but they didn't. Instead, they said no additional states can change their laws. So that's why Nevada was still allowed to do sports betting when the other states weren't. That law was recently overturned and held unconstitutional in May by the Supreme Court, which has now opened up uh, the states to kind of do whatever they want in this area. So the first one to move was New Jersey. Several other states like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Mississippi have now also passed laws. So it's going to be a huge growth, uh, a source of growth for us. Um, we launched our, our first sports betting app in New Jersey, August 1st. Um, what's good and bad, I guess, about being in this type of regulated market is they publish your and all your competitors' results every month. So last month that came out was September, and we had 67% share of the online market for sports betting. I don't think we'll stay that high because it's early on, but we were off to a commanding lead. We were almost uh, three, over three times. Uh, our next closest uh, competitor online. And so um, I think that's going to be a big part of our focus. Then, of course, we're going to continue to invest and build out our fantasy sports offering. Um, that's going to be a big part of what we do for forever, really. Uh, and then lastly, we've also begun investing in uh, the media and content side. We think there's tremendous synergies between uh, content and, and, uh, and the games themselves. Uh, if you look at traditional fantasy sports, season-long fantasy sports, all of the big players are media companies, ESPN, Yahoo, CBS, NFL. Um, so obvious synergies there. That's where we acquire our customers. That's also the content people consume. They're watching the sports and reading about it when they're playing our games. So we think there's a ton of synergy there. And that's something we think we can get a lot of value out of building. You mentioned traditional sports. While we were waiting for this session to start, 
I shared with Jason. I have a 16-year-old son who's into uh, video games and esports, and that's oh, yeah. taken off. We actually hosted in Miami just a few weeks ago a big esports conference, and it sounds like you know you're getting into this space as well, correct? We have fantasy esports now. Fantasy um, esports. Yeah. So our view that's is a fantasy of a fantasy, right? Well, it's a sport. <laughs> esports, you know, any it's anything that has spectatorship, we believe, can be translated into a fantasy game, and. Um, you've even seen like ESPN, because you know, Disney owns them and ABC, which had the Bachelorette. They had a fantasy Bachelorette game that they did last year. So kind of expanding beyond traditional sports. But eSports is obviously a huge category. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny because like, it seems like only over the last few years, people are like, huh, that's big. But it was massive before that. It's always been a big category. And I think it's just starting to get the attention of the mainstream. It's just starting to get picked up and put into broadcast form more. Obviously, Twitch has exploded in the last few years. So the spectatorship of this is really, it's real, and it's not going anywhere, and it's growing. Um, so we want to do the same thing we do with traditional sports. We want to create fantasy games. Hopefully, we'll be allowed to do uh, betting uh, in, in most states on eSports, although New Jersey, uh, in their initial law, did not allow for eSports betting. They, they thought it might be uh, something that would appeal to children. So. Um, that's something we got to watch out for in the other states, but we'll do whatever we're allowed to do and we think it's a huge category and one that we want to be a part of. So speaking of children, I, uh, I think I already mentioned this, but you've got perhaps your greatest accomplishments uh, in addition to DraftKings. You've got a four, two, and, a, and an infant. Want to share some, uh, some, uh, some uh, stories about how being a young father and how that impacts your overall work-life balance? Uh, you know, one of my investors, uh, guy Yuri Milner from DSP, when um, he was investing, and uh, at the time, um, I, I think I just had my first one, he said to me, uh, when, when you do a startup, you have three things in life, your business, and then you have kids, your family, and your friends. You can only pick two of them. Um, so I don't have many uh, chances to spend time with friends anymore. I've basically given up my social life is the short answer. And um, I think that, you know, for me, the business is, is number one, not because my family personally isn't, but because I feel I took on a responsibility to my investors who've given me capital to the 650 employees we have. And I think it would be selfish not to put that in number one. Um, but my family is pretty much 1A, and I think everything else is a distant third or fourth or whatever behind that. Um, and I try to spend every waking moment I can that I'm not working with them. Um, and you know, one of the nice things about being uh, in the type of position I'm in is you know, I'll be here randomly on a Friday or doing travel and different things. So you can find opportunities when you do that to squeeze in different hours things in with your family. So for example, I may have to work on a weekend one day but there also might be a day where I can get home at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you know, take my kids to the playground before. So I try as much as possible to find times that I can just really dedicate to them. And um, my wife has been on me for this. I'm not quite good at it yet, but putting my phone down is something I'm really focused on. I'm addicted to my phone with uh, you know, answering emails and texts. And um, I'm making a sincere effort to try to put it in another room. So even if it rings or something like that, I'll, uh, and of course, that stresses me out, so I always go check it every two seconds, but I'm getting, <laughs> I'm getting better at it. Um, you know, but it's hard, it's hard, and I, I think that you just have to figure out uh, how to do the best you can at it, but recognize that it's not going to ever be a perfect balance, and at least for me, I'm always going to feel a little bit of guilt that I'm not spending enough time with my family, but I made a commitment, and I think there's no looking back, no, no second thoughts about it. And, there's something comforting about just accepting that and not, not stressing or agonizing about it. And um, at least now, that's where I'm at. Terrific. In a few, we'll open up for a couple of questions. But I, I was out there, and hopefully a lot of you saw these coasters, which I thought was a great idea in terms of thought starters. So when I looked at my table, I saw, what did you learn from your first job? So I'll, I'll, I'll say quickly what I learned, but I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to set it up. But you know, one of my first jobs was a bag boy at Publix, which as you know, is a local supermarket chain, renowned for its customer service. So we're shopping is a pleasure. I think we all know that tagline. Uh, of course, my most vivid memory of Publix is after hours, as we were, you know, cleaning up the place, is stacking up the paper towels into bowling pins and taking the frozen turkeys and, and sliding them down the aisles. And of course, we didn't tell anybody that. But <laughs> 
So, but what I didn't learn from my first job was customer service and, and you know, taking out those bags and, and even though we weren't allowed to take tips, they had such a strong commitment to that and, and I think that is something that has served me well in any capacity, in any organization. What about you? What did you learn from your first job? Uh, well, my first job ever, my first real job, uh, was uh, scooping ice cream at a haagen in the Dadeland Food Court. Um, <laughs> I think I was 16, 15, 16 when I got it. And the biggest thing I learned was responsibility. The reason that I took that job was I wanted to have money that I could go and um, my parents made me pay for my own insurance when I got a car. I had to, you know, pay for my own uh, nights out when I would want to go out with my friends. And um, I give them a lot of credit for, for teaching me that responsibility. But I learned you got to work if you want mm -hmm. things. And um, I think I also learned a little bit about customer service, too. It, you know, nothing like uh, being in a food court to, you know, uh, see some strange characters that, that come up to the counter. Um, but you got to treat everybody like their most, your most important customer. And I, I think I learned that primarily from the person who ran the shop, who very much infused that into everybody, that every customer is important. Treat everybody like your most important customer. And that's something I've tried to take with me to DraftKings as well. Great. Well, I know we have a few minutes left. I think about seven or eight minutes or so to keep us on track. Five minutes. We have five minutes. The dean says five. It's five. <laughs> so. Um, I think we probably have time for two or three questions. I know there's a mic floating around there, but this is a small room if you want to. Hi, I had a question. Uh, when you guys initially got your seed funding, specifically being a gray regulated area, how much of importance did you have of you spending a lot of money in legal fees? Is that something you guys, because uh, you can be, with a small amount of money, you can spend a lot in legal fees and not be able to launch. So how important was, uh, how did you allocate funds for legal fees and stuff like that? Um, so I don't know that this is the best advice. I'll tell you what we did. Um, we didn't do much in that area. We had some very basic analysis done, and it was enough to get the investor comfortable at seed stage putting in money. And we said, you know, we're going to really leverage what others have done. We looked at the fact that there were 25 others in the marketplace. so. We borrowed things from their terms of use, from their you know, uh, various, you know, the privacy policy, all of that. I mean, we had a lawyer review it, but we really tried to write a lot of that ourselves and save legal fees. I think if you can save legal fees, that's money you can invest in your product and marketing and other things. And it doesn't mean that you don't do it in some places, because you have to, but um, we wrote our own incorporation docs. Like, we really tried to save there. Are you concerned with the changes in viewership and attendance at professional sports and how that might affect DraftKings? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's a double-edged sword. Um, the short answer is yes. I mean, if sports viewership is growing, that helps our business. So that's a good thing. Um, but I say it's a double-edged sword because it actually has a really positive effect too. The sports leagues, for the first time ever, um, and if you had asked me five years ago if this were going to happen, I would have told you, absolutely not, you're crazy. They all want sports betting now. They all want to see more gaming in sports. And they love us and they love what we're doing, not only in fantasy sports, but on the betting side. I mean, this is, you know, deep-seated stuff they, in these leagues they've been against for years and years. Uh, and now they flipped. And I think a big part of that is they understand that the engagement, the young audience it attracts, and those things are critical uh, to the future of their growth. So, you know, yes, I want more viewership, but also I think our relevance and importance to the sports leagues, the media companies, and the overall sports ecosystem would not be as high as it is if it weren't for that. Final question, that's it? Yeah, I, I think, think, think we're all set. Well, I think we're wrapped up, but let's give Jason a big hand for coming out from Boston. Thank you. You did great. I appreciate it.